Today I want to do something that's a little bit different for you. I want to talk to you about long-term trusts, beneficiary controlled trusts, and dynasty trusts where the client's goal is to preserve or perpetuate or protect wealth for typically more than one generation. But I also want to talk to you about our experience in finding out who does these and why, and how you might be able to use that in your own practices and in your own marketing. Because we've been pretty meticulous about studying exactly who does these, why they do it, why they tell us they come in, and what they tell us was useful and good and beneficial to them when they leave. And uh, I have 9,000 clients, so we have a pretty good uh, experience over about 29 years. Somebody was making fun of me because it says in the bio, I guess, more than 29 years. I'd like to keep a little mystery. And uh, so we have a lot of data over a large number of people. And I'm fortunate to live in an area like you do where there's a, a fairly significant amount of concentrated wealth. But it's a very diverse area, so I could talk to you a little bit about uh, who's making these decisions for a lot of different reasons. I want to give you the information that you need to know to be able to assist your clients no matter what area you're working in. And I will tell you this, if you're not the lawyer and you're giving them some of the information that I'm going to give you today and some of the ways of thinking about these things, you're going to get more credit than the lawyers do anyway. We, we have found the following, that when we appeal to people who are between the ages of 52 and 67, that that is a sweet spot for this kind of planning. Below 52, they don't really seem to recognize the value of it. So we spend a lot of time educating and not getting you know, a benefit for us for that. Because most people below the age of 52 don't do it. Here's my theory on that. By the time you're 52 to 55, you've had some friends die. Your parents are now at risk or have passed away. You may have had a bad experience with their estate planning. Your kids are getting married. You have suspicions and worries about the people they're marrying or not marrying. So there are all of these extrinsic motivators in their lives that make them want it more. So you're now marketing, if you go to that audience of 52 on up, you're marketing to somebody who wants what you have, if you're talking about this, rather than having to explain, explain, explain away. Ah, OK, good. I still haven't played the didgeridoo music, so I've got to get to that. So there's a huge advantage in marketing to, there doesn't seem to be a demographic breakdown. We have single men and single women. Um, typically, the thing that's driving this, though, obviously, is whether they're married or divorced, they have living children or grandchildren. Beneficiary controlled trusts, anybody 52 and above that has kids, they're all over it. Dynastic trusts, more tilting toward the 60, 65, and the reason for that, we think, is again, they have grandchildren already that they know and they like, and so they are motivated to try to protect assets. Anybody that has a ne'er-do-well child who has children that they know and like, I have a lot of clients that say, my daughter's a goofball or my son is a bum, but I love his kids and they're going to be fine, notwithstanding how crazy he is. So anybody that's got that. So when you're, when you're writing copy or doing reports or doing a webinar or talking about all of these things, and Brenda and I are happy to be a resource for you because we've done all of those things and we can tell you if you want to try any of them, we can shortcut your path to success there. Um, you want to be appealing, I think, to somebody that's between the age of 52 and 67. They are either married or divorced and they have children for BCT and for dynasty trust, they have grandchildren that are sort of above the age of 10. That's really when you see people getting interested in this. Then here's the other advantage to appealing primarily to that demographic. And remember, we talked about the net worth already. The advantage to appealing to that demographic is they not only want what you have to talk about, they have a general sense that uh, you know, there are things about this that they don't understand. They're actually hungry for the knowledge and to have somebody explain it to them in a way that makes sense to them. And for the first time in their lives, they have the money to do it. Now, this is true even of very affluent people. Because uh, all of my clients, whether they have a net worth of $5 million or $167 million, in their 50s or in their 40s and early 50s, they're all in. Uh, they're deal junkies. My clients who are entrepreneurial, they will not give anything away during their lifetime. They don't want to think about this. And to the extent that they would they would rather 
whether it was $5,000 or $50,000 in planning fees till they're all done. They'd much rather keep that in the business or do something else with, else with it. By the time they're in their mid-50s, they've got the kids through school. All these things that panic them and scare them about cash flow. And don't kid yourself. My very affluent clients are scared about cash flow because they only keep so much money in cash in the bank and the rest is in the deals and illiquid. But they've overcome that. 52 is a little young for that, but certainly by the time you get into the early 60s, they've overcome that. So they not only are ready, willing, and able to buy, they have the, the, the cash to do it, and they respect you. So that's a nice thing. You're not arguing with the client, trying to sell them, trying to convince them. You're just explaining what their options are in a way they've never, with clarity that they've never received or gotten before. And when you show them that you could legitimately give them options that they've never seen before, or never, even if they've seen them, they haven't had them properly explained to them, you are a hero. And if you hit worries by either the affluent person's partner or spouse, or you're getting that pushback from kids later on, here's a magic pill that we found. I have drafted, uh, this is in Blotmocker software. A anybody here use legal interactive? What, what, do you, what, do you, what software do you guys use? You have your own documents. We do both, depending on the circumstances. But, but the clause I'm going to give you, I originally saw in Blotmocker software years ago, and I adopted this and started talking about it, and it is a magic pill. When spouses or spouses of kids or kids worry, hey, if this is going to be in trust, how can I be sure that I'm going to get the enjoyment of this? We can put in a clause that says, without altering the discretion of the trustee, the trustee may consider the needs of my spouse, or if it's the children generation, my children, or if it's the grandchildren generation, my grandchild, to be more important than those of the needs of the other descendants. So this isn't appropriate for everybody, because somebody could be worried about a child, and they don't want the money to be spent on them, and they do want it protected for the grandchildren. But where I have a spouse that's worried about getting access to this money, I tell them the following. You're right to be worried, but here's why you should be worried, not for the reasons you think. The document's really clear. You're going to get the use of this. You're going to enjoy it. You should be worried because trustees, the independent trustee, might be afraid that if they're too generous with you, under, even if it's allowed by the document, that they're going to get sued by the next generation. So when I put a clause in here that clarifies that it's the intent of the set law, grantor, trustor, whatever you want to call them, that it's the intent that the spouse or the child or the grandchild can be treated better and that we don't need to worry as much about the next generation. That, I have never had anybody who expressed worry about access to principle, who when we're done with that little discussion, isn't much more relaxed and usually withdraws their objection to it.